thanks for having me here. Oh yeah, behind the line. And um, I'll talk about um, uh, designing drugs with machine learning. And um, as you already have seen, um, I'm only one wheel in the gear. And so I would also like to give props to um, all the other colleagues who are not here, particularly our MSc students. And yeah, maybe I should quickly introduce myself. I'm not a data scientist. I'm actually a toxicologist with focus on computational methods. And I have also a slight background in pharmaceutical engineering. Um, I don't want to go through my CV, but um, um, I have a nice picture which kind, of, which kind of describes from what area I'm from and what yeah, companies, universities and institutes I've seen so far. So if anything looks familiar to you, um, even my uncle or Karl Marx, feel free to chat me up. Um, so let's start with a very old fashioned terminology because uh, when, when I started with modeling, predictive model was not such a famous term. It was more this still the 90s expression of CUSA, quantitative structure activity relationships, which is basically trying to um, put biological effects on the one hand and um, chemical information on the other hand. So, um, for example, uh, if you have a certain chemical compound and it gives you headaches, if you then change one atom, <coughs> will it give you more headaches or will it give you less headaches? This is what people who are into users give headaches. At least someone's laughing, okay. Um, and yeah, of course, these are, can be um, solved these issues with regression or classification models. And um, there are a lot of different biological end, uh, endpoints of interest. Um, some are uh, toxicity related, some others are pharmacokinetics. So uh, a hashtag at me, absorption, distribution, metabolism, elimination. And, um, and of course activities toward um, certain protein targets. So if we know we want to be happy and we have therefore block a serotonin transporter, then um, we want to hit this compound and therefore we might have um, IC50 data and then we try to do regression models. And um, in-house, we are big fans of cream and mocha. So cream is our uh, classification and regression at Merck. And uh, this is basically a Python environment and a tool which holds a um, versatile variety of machine learning algorithms and different validation methods. And we um, basically in incorporate or implement these kind of machine learning um, models we built there into uh, another tool called Mocha, uh, so the Merck Online Computational, Computational Chemistry Analyzer. So bottoms up. Um, so this is how it looks. If uh, so, one of our medicinal chemists is using our tool. He basically um, goes uh, uh, here and draws a structure or uploads a whole batch. Um, and notice this is not MDMA. This is oxymetazoline from from Nazivine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so and basically, people can choose here in our our mocha store. Um, they can choose here uh, for for their pumpkin spice, low fat. Uh, decaf or yeah, what other what kind of model they want for their predictions and then just press on play and they get uh, their predictions and if they then click um, on for example on uh, the, the so soluble button and they want to know what it is here are some descriptions so what is the experiment behind so what does it mean um, what are the interesting compounds from our training data of course this is sensor because the, the new block blockbuster could be behind there Probably not, but you never know. Um, and of course, um, we also try to give uh, a confidence score. So how reliable is our prediction? And um, yeah, also we have some other nice features um, like um, um, a, a change log and news and FAQ, um, um, our stats so people can look at our statistical performance. Um, and of course, a block where we write down our achievements when people use successfully Mocha within a project. So yeah, just to brag. Um, so our most successful machine learning algorithms are still old school multivariate regression, particularly for physical chemical properties. So the bit simpler stuff. No chemist here to disagree. That's good. Um, but overall, um, random forest is probably the most important machine learning alg algorithm followed by gradient boosted trees and also more and more, if we have find some time, um, for deep neural networks. 
Um, there are two other kind of modeling types which are still important and they don't have much to do with machine learning. Um, the one is uh, our expert systems. So just imagine an 80-year-old chemist sitting on a chair with a pipe and telling you, no, oh, if you put a methoxy group on this benzene ring, yeah? And then someone that, like me has to write all the stuff down and have to put it into code. This would be an, an expert system. And um, the 3D structure-based stuff would be, yeah, if you, if you look how uh, mechanical engineers in the automotive industry um, trying to put in a certain machine element uh, into the engine and then also wiggle a little bit around, um, that's, that's what we do here if we have a protein structure. We uh, see um, if what the physical forces say, does it fit in there and so on. So this both plays still a, um, a big role. It's not only machine learning driven. But we are here to talk about machine learning. So I want to give you a little impression how good our models are. Um, so the models which our medicinal chemists use on a daily basis, we, the last retraining with it um, early April. And for example, the, the left one is a binary um, classification model. Um, and this is, uh, the essay is basically a, yeah, an in vitro essay, so um, a lab tube experiment to model a specific type of cardiotoxicity. So to generalize it very broadly, the likelihood for getting arrhythmia from a drug. Don't name me on this. But yeah. And um, here we, for example, we, we get an accuracy within the cross-validation of 0.8. A free class model for um, caco permeability, so how well a compound is taken up by our gut. Again, only a little lab assay. Um, is then uh, yeah, at ne nearly 0 0.7 within the five-fold cross-validation. Another example <coughs> is um, how stable a compound is. So if we put it in the same lab tube with some liver enzymes, will it be metabolized immediately? Because this would lead to a not very stable drug. And then before it was once through our cellular system, it's already metabolized, and then it won't do any actions uh, at, at the, our target of interest. Um, therefore, we have this Clint assay. So the stats, I think, are even a little bit worse than the, the Kako ones up there. But here we did something very interesting. Um, we looked at the predictions with the highest confidence. We took the 70 compounds from which were corrected. Uh, which were predicted correctly and which were predicted incorrectly. So the highest confidence uh, predictions we took. And we asked the people who did the experiment, wouldn't you be so kind and repeat the experiment? And they did. And, and we identified with the, the incorrect predictions, um, we identified a lot of predictions which were actually correct. So the experiment, they have also a certain variability and we were able to identify some data which was not very correctly in our data set. So in rare cases, even um, in silico, so computation models are better than the um, lab assays. But don't tell them, they won't hear it. So now we come to a topic which uh, might be most interesting to you. Um, it's about uh, our neural networks approach and how we um, how we do basically our optimization procedure because we have so many different, um, yeah, the, the grid you need to search is so huge and um, you have to optimize through all those hyperparameters. And uh, just uh, wording wise, um, um, I use the term hyperparameters for everything. It doesn't matter if it's uh, um, an architectural feature of a net or if it's um, yeah, something like a parameter like an optimizer. So. Before I dig into this, um, let me quickly show you something about validation strategies. There are two different validation strategies which are common um, when, we wanna, when we apply deep learning. Um, the one is just an asset cross-validation, so a cross-validation within a cross-validation, where the inner loop is used for um, the grid search. And um, the right one is uh, as something, let's say, um, camera informatics specific. Here we actually, um, we try to put all the chemical information in certain clusters. So if compounds look alike, they, come in, they go into the same bucket, so in the same cluster. And then we basically, we do um, the um, optimization against, um, of course in, in each loop, against one cluster and the final validation against another. And 
people are promising that um, although the st statistics for the right validation procedure is worse than for the left, the models are more able to generalize. So if a model succeeds and predicts compounds which do not look at all like the compounds which are in the training data, then this model understood something. And this is what um, we believe in, and, uh, but there's no proper measure for it. But, um, it's, uh, but it's a very important topic within the, the world of chemoinformatics and um, in silico models and within drug design. Um, so regarding um, our optimization, uh, we had a very smart MSc student who um, yeah, programmed a GA. And here he's act he is basically um, creating a population with uh, yeah, some, some random um, hyperparameters. And then they go through this uh, um, nested cross-validation procedure. And at the end, you get um, your uh, outer kappa value, so the, the Cohen's kappa for the outer loops. And based on this, you, um, you, you source your models. And the best ones, they deserve to live. And uh, so they basically, they can um, you know, cross over. You know what I mean? And, uh, of, and they also, yeah, they're also allowed to mutate. So um, yeah. However, they, they, they can live. And so this is basically, this, this then leads to the next generation and the next generation. And so you get um, a lot of different models you can compare. And one interesting output is uh, this one, where we compared different, uh, different pairs with each other. So where everything, where all the hyperparameters were the same between models, and uh, they would only change by one hyperparameter, and we identified a proper VIP, uh, a very important parameter. Um, so the optimizer is the hyperparameter which has the most impact on um, getting a good model. Um, also, the first layer activation function um, was quite good, so it was improving the kappa value, the outer kappa value, and yeah. Um, Quick look at our user interface. So he was really into um, he was really into old school video games. And uh, but the nice thing is, I mean, every box stands for a model, and you can see everything within a, a, within one box. At least the the most crucial information. And there's maybe one one little thing I would like to mention. Um, there's a, a little penalty which is in the script. Um, if you have two models which perform equally good, and one model does its work within, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, three layers, and another one does it in two layers. You would prefer the one in two layers because it has less, um, it's less likely to be overfitted. And so therefore, we did a little penalty for those models which, yeah, uh, so well, for the models which, which do things too complicated. Um, so a, a quick comparison. Um, these are our standard machine learning algorithms we, we, we used and compared. And um, we left a little test data out. Um, actually, this, these were um, within the MSC. Uh, within the time of the MSC, these were all compounds which have been synthesized new and tested. Therefore, we had new experimental data. And then we, yeah, we, we checked how well the models performed. And we didn't have um, the, the GA, so the genetic algorithm, DNN, for all, but f we have them for free. And two out of three, they won against all the other machine learning algorithms. And um, yeah, maybe I should note that, the, that the, this Herc model is a binary one. This is why it's, over, uh, why it's uh, generally a bit better performing than the other one. Um, and of course, these are kappa values. They always look a little bit tiny. Um, yeah, it was cold. Um, Another interesting thing we, we've seen was that um, over the different um, uh, generations, there was the average performance was increasing of the models. Um, but very funnily, the max performance of a single model uh, was already up in the very first generation. But as we use consensus models, so we, we don't do a retraining with 100% of the data afterwards, we, um, we, we try to uh, keep one uh, one model because we have, so we, try, we try to keep the models for the outer loops so we have the actually stats for those models and not just the stats for, uh, the, yeah, the, 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 for, the, for the approach. Um, yeah, it's a management thing. Um, 
Yeah. So may I just quickly conclude? So um, drug design still uses a lot of machine learning and even I would say more than a, a few years ago due to um, new publications and also internal experience with new biological endpoints. And also some traditional endpoints like this HERC, statistical performance just gets better. So if there's a new publication on a new neural network on gradient boost, people just use it and then they see a little boost and they enjoy using it. And uh, regarding the, the GA, so genetic algorithm, um, so we, we, we basically for the final prediction, so what our medicinal chemists use um, would be um, a consensus model based on uh, five times five models. So basically the, the, winner from, the winners from the grid search. And um, the calculation time is between eight and 14 hours for a single endpoint. Um, so far we didn't do that much experience. Um, we don't have much experience with the multitasking yet, um, at least not in-house. Um, and yeah, and generally the GA looks promising. So two out of three cases at one, hopefully more in future. And uh, what we are generally in future um, uh, looking for is an, an, um, we want to investigate update mechanisms because we get new experimental data on a weekly basis and we can't just uh, let, let all the stuff run over the weekend because it's just too much. And there are some nice strategies um, how to incorporate them and then just doing one training epoch and this kind of stuff. This is what we're looking into. Then of course we're looking into multitasking. What what models you can combine smart in a smart way together because not every essay is speaking with another essay not every essay has the same quality and also we are very interested in inter interpretability because we have to explain the medicinal chemist why a model does a certain prediction of course we don't have always a proper answer but we try to give one so we can give them an idea how to improve the current comp uh, to, to improve the current compounds. So I think that's it.